If you've got your Bibles, open up to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be looking at that here in just a moment. We're in the sermon series we've got this week, and next week will be our last week. And so uh, come and be a part. And we'll start into some brand new stuff that t- at that time. We talked about how Barnabas was older, and he discipled Paul, and then Paul discipled the younger Timothy. Who are you discipling, and who is discipling you? Got another week of asking you that question. I hope you're getting it. And some people are coming to me and letting me know who is discipling them. And some are coming and telling me who uh, they're actually pouring into as well. And so uh, look into that and pray that the Lord would give you somebody to pour into and also somebody to receive from. We're in the pastoral letters here, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Those, that's this genre of literature. And uh, so this morning we'll be looking at how to handle treasure. And at this time, Lydia is going to come and read our scripture for us, wherever she might. There she is. She's going to come up and read verses 17 through 19. So if you've got your Bibles open up there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Sorry, short. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be ignorant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Lydia, 2 Timothy, a few uh, verses for us to dig into, dive into, and examine together. We want to exegete the Scriptures. That's a fancy way of saying to draw meaning out of the Scriptures. There's a word here from God to us, and so listen closely as we exegete or draw meaning out of these Scriptures together today. Talking about being rich, fill in the blank if you know this. Being rich is having more than you need. That's rich, right? Having more than you need. If you have more than you need, that's rich. That's being rich. Say, well, I'm not as rich as somebody else. <laughs> well, don't look at somebody else. Look at what the Lord has given you. We are rich when we have more than we need. Did you know I have, I have three pairs of brown shoes? I've got two pairs of black shoes. I, I've only got two feet, right? Now, I'm not saying give everything away, but I'm just saying I am rich. I have five pairs of dress shoes. Think about that. Isn't that crazy? No? Well, I have more than I need. Now, if I grow about four more legs, then I'll need all those shoes at once. But I am blessed. I am blessed. I've got more socks. I've got more than I need. I mean, God has blessed me. You say, what are you talking about? I'm just saying, look at what God has given you. We are rich. We are rich. In fact, we've said it before. If you have running water in your house and you have electricity, You're in the top 10% of the world's wealth. Think about that for a moment. We're rich. Speaking of of money, it can cause a lot of issues. There was a man who was very wealthy, and he knew that he couldn't take his money with him when he died. But he was getting close to dying, and he knew it. He had three friends, and he said, You know, guys, you've been my buddies all my life. And I know I can't take my money with me, but I'm not sure. I don't know. So here's what I want you to do. Would you promise me that each of you would put $1,000 into an envelope inside my casket if I should die before you. And they all promised they'd do it. And so uh, the fella did. He died. And so he had the uh, undertaker put an envelope, an empty envelope, in the casket with him. And so all the people are going by to pay the respects, and the first friend goes up, and he puts $1,000 cash in there. The second guy, he comes up, and he puts $1,000 cash in there. Third guy came along, and the friends were kind of watching him. He seemed like he did kind of a switcheroo on him. And they were like, what happened? He took something, he put something in, he took something out. And afterwards they asked him, what'd you do? I put my thousand in, the other put his thousand in. What'd you do? He said, well, I forgot my cash, so I took the two thousand out and I put a check in for three thousand dollars. Smart man, huh? Money can make us do some weird things. We're gonna talk about what money can do to us and how do we handle our money? How do we handle our money? So three things I want to talk about this morning: danger to avoid, a duty to fulfill and a development to consider. A danger to avoid, think about money, a danger to avoid, a duty to fulfill, and a development to consider. This is gonna be fun. This is a great study, and it's for everybody in here. So when I say we're talking about the rich, don't think about anybody else except you. Teenagers in here are rich. Teens, raise your hand if you have more than one pair of shoes. 
Look at that. They're rich. All of them are rich. We've got rich teens right here. All right. Paul says right here to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. That's an unusual word. We don't use that all the time. High-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us, us richly all things to enjoy. That's one word, charge. It's the same idea as this word right here. Another translation, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. High-minded, proud, haughty, I've got, I've got it all together. And that riches can cause us to be high-minded, can cause us to be haughty, to be proud. And the Bible says we are not to be high-minded. We are to look at others with love and compassion. And God gives us wealth for a reason. Why? To bless other people. Deuteronomy says that God actually gives us the ability to make money. God gives some of you, he's given some of you a greater ability than others. God gives us the ability to make money. So we're to command. Paul is to command Timothy, and Timothy is to command the church. Command those who are rich in this present world. Who are the rich? They're sitting on your left and on your right, and you are too. You are rich. So think about yourself this morning as we go through this passage together. So a danger to avoid, the danger facing those who are rich. What is that? It's being conceited. It's pride to think lofty of oneself. Proverbs 28, 11 says this, A rich man is wise in his own eyes, but a poor man who has understanding will find him out. There's something about wealth that can cause us to get a little snooty. Well, I'm better than you know who. They don't have anything. Ah. Be careful. A rich man is wise in his own eyes. In Philippians 2, 3, this is the, the kenosis passage. That's a Greek word that just means it's, that Christ emptied himself out. He, he emptied himself of everything but his godhood. In Philippians, that's what it's talking about, this, this self-emptying that Jesus did. Jesus being the richest of all, God, he came down from heaven. He condescended. He came to us. He poured himself out for us. And here it is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Whether you have money or not, no matter your color, no matter your creed, your education, whether you're male, you're female, doesn't matter. Value others. Consider others to be better than you. The second part, a danger to avoid, is being tempted. Fixing hope on riches. That can happen. Well, if I just had this X amount of dollars in the bank account, I'd be happy. No. Remember they, they talked about, they asked Rockefeller that. Mr. Rockefeller, one of the richest men at that time in the world, said, how much money would it take to, for you to be satisfied? He said, just a little bit more. The richest man in the world thought he needed a little bit more to be satisfied. So being tempted, you can fix your hope on riches, on your 401k and on your IRA, and it's okay to have those things. We're told in Proverbs to be like the ant and to get ready for the future, no doubt about it. But don't fix your hope on riches. It's dangerous. Here it is from Proverbs 11:28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Proverbs 23, 4, and 5, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Money is not good or bad. It's amoral. But it's what you do with your money. Again, we've already talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Paul's coming back to this again for some reason. There, there are probably some very rich people in the church in Ephesus. And Paul is addressing them. There are poor people in the church of Ephesus. Paul is addressing them all. But here he is talking to the rich people. He's saying, if you're rich. Now, a couple weeks ago is don't be eager to get rich. Now this week, it's be careful with your riches so they don't control you. Trying to get rich all the time, it can drive you crazy. It, it, can, just, it can just leave you battling all the time. You hear about people that have tried to wage so much money in Wall Street, and they put so much there, and and then it just bellies up and they've lost so much money and they think, what can I do? And they're so far in. They talk about people that on Wall Street that have lost so much money, they are jumping out of the windows up on sixth or seventh floor, falling to the ground. They're in over their head. They can't keep up anymore. Wages and wealth can destroy us if we're not careful. And then lastly, a solution. Fix your hope on God who richly supplies all things to enjoy. That's the solution. Fix your hope on God. Thank you, God, for money. 
but God, you're my source. Thank you, God, for a pantry, but you're my source. Thank you, God, for a 401k, but God, you're my source. God is your provider. Amen. Amen. He is our provider. In fact, Jesus said this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Well, it's Jesus. Good, but look at that a little bit. We are wealthy, so we need to be careful. This is an admonition to us as a wealthy people. We're one of the, America's the wealthiest nation in the world, and we're fortunate to be in this nation. But be careful that, that wealth, like Jesus says, doesn't choke out the life of God in us. Wealth has a, a, a tendency to choke out the life in us. I'm not against wealth, but it's are you controlling your wealth? Is your wealth controlling you? So this idea again, charge those. Here's another word. It was, it was command. It, it, it's, 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 now I hear it, it's changed to charge. Charge those who are rich. So I'm doing my best this morning to charge you, Brockington Road, that you not be haughty, that we be not haughty, nor that we have our hope set on the uncertainty of riches, but on the living God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God wants us to enjoy things. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's not wrong to enjoy in fact, I think Jesus probably had some good belly laughs while he was on earth. I mean, he, he would have been joyful, although he knew there was scorn ahead and there was the cross ahead, but I'm sure he enjoyed his day-to-day -day living. It's okay to enjoy your life. It's okay, teens, to laugh and have a great time, and I'm with you. I love to have a good time. But remember that what brings us joy is that God is our provider. God is our hope. He is the one that gives us what we need. I, I uh, heard this story. I thought I'm going to pass it on to you. It's pretty good. It's a uh, a missionary had been witnessing faithfully to a certain man in another country who was an idol worshiper. One day, the man placed a small statue and a silver coin on the table in front of the missionary. Then the pagan took two slips of paper and wrote something on each. On the note by the idol, he wrote the words, Heathen God. On the sheet next to the silver coins, gold coins, he wrote the words, Christian God. From what that man, that pagan, had observed in the lives of some people called so-called Christians from those nations, he had concluded that money was the main object of their adoration and the source of their confidence. Many people today choose to worship the God of money. They make it the object of their trust, their love, their service. But how foolish, Jesus warned, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if you came to an altar, maybe when you were a teenager at the old church, and maybe you got saved, or maybe you've, you've come to an altar at some time in your life, and you got saved, and you're gloriously saved, and then at some point in your life, you start getting rich, and you start letting that become your God, and then Jesus says how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That scripture is for me and you. Be careful with your wealth. It has tentacles to it. It can get a hold of our hearts. It can get a hold of our minds. So be careful with the money that God has given to you. Command them, the rich, to do good. Here's what they're supposed to do. Command them, the rich, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Okay? That's what they're supposed to do. So the duty to fulfill. What's the duty defined? Here it is. The duty defined. And number one, instruct them to do good. What is that? It's noble and excellent. Do good. Do good with your money. Do good with your deeds. Do good with your attitudes. Do good with your words. And then number two, rich in good works, abundantly furnished. We've been blessed, blessed, blessed. Do you all know how much we've been blessed? And if you have a pantry at home, you have any food in the pantry, that's a good thing. When I was at Mid-American Nazarene College, then now university in Olathe, Kansas, there was a girl in one of my classes, it was a missionary class, missions class. She was from Africa. And they were talking about, does God still do miracles? Does God still do miracles? And people were debating this back and forth. These theologians in these classes were debating, does God still do miracles? And does God still show up and help us in our day to day? And this little African girl was so quiet, the whole class. And at the end, our professor, Dr. Frank Moore, said, 
you haven't said anything. What are you thinking right now? She said, oh, Dr. Moore. She said, oh, I believe in miracles. She said, where I came from, we don't have enough to eat every day, and we have to pray for God to supply our daily bread. We actually pray, and God shows up, and He supplies our needs. We experience God's miracles every day. I'm like, Whew. that was an indictment on us theologians, thinking we were going to tell her about miracles, and she was experiencing them because she trusted in God. Be generous, bountiful. That's from 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. And then number four, ready to share. Koinonia, that's that Greek word. Fellowship and sharing and caring. We're to share what we have with others, not just money, our lives to share with those around us. I pray you are being generous with your time. So this way to say this in verse 18, instruct them to do as many good deeds as they can and to help everyone. Remind the rich to be generous and share what they have. Share. How do you do that? Well, there's so much need. Where do you start? Where do I start? There's a, there's a guy on every corner with a sign that says, we'll work for food. Where do we start? I don't think it's there. I think it's somewhere closer than that. I think it's somewhere around us. I think it's someone that's right next to us. It's somebody that we come across. Now, it could be them, but I, I think it's, even, it's just something even better than that. It's, God, how can I help those around me with not only my money, but my deeds and my life and my words, my prayers, to pray with somebody. Pastor Samuel and I got to go and, and visit uh, somebody this last week. It was Ted Kelly, and we were leaving, and uh, there's a receptionist at the desk there at St. Vincent's North, and... She said, well, you guys weren't up there long. I said, well, he's really sleepy from all his therapy, and he wanted to go to sleep, and so we just prayed and left. And she said, oh. And I said, what about you? I said, do you need any prayer? Her name was Bobby. She said, yeah, I need prayer. I've got kids. I was like, enough said, right? And so how can we be generous with just our lives? That's what I'm talking about. All of us can do that, right? I don't have enough money to be generous. Well, you have time. You have, a vocal, you have vocal cords. You can encourage somebody around you. Encourage them in their faith. Encourage them in their walk with Jesus. It's amazing uh, what the Church of the Nazarene does around the world and what the United States even, for that matter, does. We're the most generous country in the world. I don't, I don't know what you're hearing on the news, but we are the most generous country in the world. Now, we're the richest country in the world. We should be. So we, we're very giving people. I don't know if you heard about this. Uh, you remember that, that tsunami that happened a few years ago? That aftermath of that tsunami disaster in Southeast Asia, Christians quickly poured in money, materials, and manpower to bring relief in the suffering. Believers showed this generosity in their local communities as well. Think about this. These are stories I've heard in the last year. These are stories I've heard personally. I'm not going to give any names. Believers show their generosity in their local communities as well. When a family lost their home and all their belongings in a fire, a flood of assistance, money, food, clothing, a temporary place to live came from fellow believers all over the, the area to help them get through it. How about this one? When a husband walked out on his wife and three children after depleting the family savings account and running up huge bills, the people of the church stepped up with spiritual, emotional, and financial support. Some of the women of the church faithfully encircled her with prayer and encouragement. Folks, this is stuff we can do right now. These believers are following the plan of God for the Christian life. There are needs all around you that you can have a vital part in meeting. Are you rich in good deeds? Are you rich in good works? Are you willing to share? I tell you what, our Compassionate Ministries arm of the Church of the Nazarene, when you give to Faith Promise in this church, that money goes to help with needs around the area. In, in Arkansas, in the United States, and around the globe. Our giving makes a difference. We're giving, why? Because we've been blessed. Use your dollars to make a difference in the life of somebody else. And then development to consider. Here it is, investing in eternity. This is the, I want to really drive this home for us. Number one, storing up. Where do you store up? In your bank? Yes, you can. But a better place is an eternity. Store up treasures there. A good, a good foundation fund. It's a dividend, not in this life. How do you put your money in heaven? Well, you can't put your physical money there, right? You can't send money off. You can't, you can't forward it to heaven. You can't Venmo heaven. You, you can't. So what do you do? You do good deeds for the life of Christ on this earth. And those are then laid up in heaven. When you invest in young people to go to camp, when you invest in young people to go to NYC, you're investing in eternity. When you're teaching a Sunday school class, some of you give lots of time to study your lessons. 
and you pour into your class, you are investing in eternity. Some of you do meals for other people whenever they're sick, when they're, they're down, they're out, and you make meals and you take them there. You're investing in eternity. See, you're, you're, you're spreading goodwill of Jesus Christ. Some of you give money to people and no one even knows you're quiet, which is the best way to do it. Shh, be quiet. And you give to help other people. That is storing up treasures in heaven. And then number three, life indeed, eternal life. True understanding of this world and the world to come. Can you imagine trying to take money up into heaven? You're like, okay, here I am. I made it into heaven. I've got a lot of stuff I want to help here in heaven. Let's see, we need to add some stuff here. I've got, here's your wallet. And you open it up and they go, uh, sorry, what are all those coins in your pocket, sir? And I said, well, I want to help heaven. They said, you know, here, here's what you do. Take those coins and just throw them out in the street because they're streets of gold. Our money here is God's asphalt. Give your money away now. Serve now because your money's worth nothing. I, I've gone on mission trips where you go down and, and you find some pesos or whatever in Mexico and you come back and you bring that money back and you can't use it. It's not worth anything here. It's useless here. You go back to Mexico, it, it's worth something, but here it's not. Same in heaven. Our money's not worth anything there. It's useless. Use your money here to invest in eternity. Application, are you managing your treasure? That's your time, your talents, and your, and your money. Or T, the three T's, time, talents, treasure, in a God-honoring way. Again, I'm not talking about tithe. That's just the beginning point. A tithe to God, a 10% to God. That's just the beginning. I'm talking about your life, your wallet, your offerings, serving, helping, loving, encouraging those around you. I pray you are. Number two, are you investing in the souls of men and women for the furtherance of God's kingdom? How? Serving in a nursery, helping with a youth group, sending kids off to this or that encouraging older people in the church, writing letters to those who are shut in. You are an encouragement to somebody else. You're investing in eternity when you do those things with your life and your money. And then finally, do you truly possess an eternal perspective? What are we going after? I want to be the richest man in Pulaski County. And then you die, then what? Richest man in the cemetery? What does that matter, right? But instead, if we were the richest when we were serving God with our funds, with our life, possess an eternal perspective. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. That's a great way to look at it. Save, save. We're to do that biblically. We're to save. We don't want to be a burden on society. Earn all you can, save all you can, and then give all you can. I want to let you circle that in your life. Take that red pencil. Are you going to let money be something that causes greed in you or something that causes generosity in you? You get to circle that, and your life will show it. Your checkbook will already show which one you've circled. But you can make some changes and say, Lord, I want to be a generous person, not a greedy person. So a danger to avoid, a duty to fulfill, and a development to consider, heaven. I want to tell you in closing a, a story about a man that was very influential in my life. His name was Bill. That's not his picture. I got that picture online. I, I didn't want to put a picture of him up. His name's Bill. This man was influential when I was a teenager. This man named Bill helped out in the youth group. I don't know if he had a lot of money or not. He always dressed nice. He wore a suit and tie to church every Sunday morning. He helped out with the teens. Bill was so kind. Bill would help with things, and he would help with people that couldn't go to camp or couldn't go to this. We had retreats in those days to different places, and he would help. And then he'd say to the youth pastor, Bill would say to the youth pastor, do you need any volunteers to go on that trip? And the youth pastor said, yes, we need some male volunteers. Can you stay in a cabin with about 14 young guys? And he was like, I'll do it. <laughs> and I tell you what, I was in that cabin with Bill, and I love Bill. Some of the other guys were really zany and wacky, and they tortured Bill with pranks and all kinds of just ludicrous things. And Bill kept just his cool about him. He'd smile and laugh along. And these Now, he wasn't cool, so to speak, like teens would think, but... The teens knew that Bill loved them. Bill gave his money, but he gave more than that. He gave his life. He served. His wife did as well. And Bill would go on trips. I remember as a teenager, he'd come with us. He'd be on the bus next to me, driving up to Kansas City to go to Worlds of Fun, this theme park. And I'd just wear Bill out with questions and laughing and joking and tapping him and touching him and poking him. And Bill just kept smiling and loving me and encouraging me. And then I remember going to the altar in church and kneeling down. And guess what? Bill came down too to pray with me. There are others, but Bill would be there. 
Wasn't my dad, wasn't my uncle. He was a spiritual mentor to me. He was like a grandfather in the church to not only me, but other teens. He gave his money, he gave his time, he gave his love, and he gave his prayers. He was a generous man. I leave that example with us today. Could you be a bill for somebody else? Could you, could you be that encourager to somebody else? Not just youth, but anybody God brings across your path that we could be an encouragement to somebody else. I pray we will. Time is short. Use the time you've got and the money God's given you to bless somebody else. Amen. Let's stand together for a word of prayer.